Uh, yeah, yeah, you can go ahead and start now. All right, folks. Uh, how are you feeling today? Um, I'm Dan Passarelli. Uh, I'm just checking right over here for stuff I got to check for that I can share with you today. Uh, good. Now I've got all that all set up for you. Perfect. All right. So yeah, please enter your symbols. T Downey says, good. I don't think you want me to check symbol G-O-O-D, do you? Uh, I think you're just saying good. <clears throat> um, so while you are waiting, here's here's what I'm checking. I'm checking for what stocks have earnings coming out after the close today because we're in earnings season. And earnings season is a big deal. Earnings season is kind of what I do, um, one of the main things that I do. And so Alcoa apparently has earnings coming out after the close today. <clears throat> but, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you, T. Downey. I much appreciate that. Uh, loud and clear. Yes. Good. I'm glad that uh, you can hear me loud and clear. So whenever I uh, look at a list of what stocks have earnings coming out, the first thing, and when there's a stock that that list tells me has earnings coming out, the first thing that I do is what? What do you think is the first thing that I do? I'm going to teach you something fantastic today. What do you think is the first thing that I do when I see a list of stocks that have earnings coming out? Nobody wants to guess. I'm just going to tell you then, because that's why I'm here. I go A, A in, wait, yeah, A, A in Vestor Relations. Not American Airlines. This is Alcoa. Wait. Alcoa Investor Relations presentation. Or just Investor Relations. We go to present or we go to events. And we look at the old events calendar and April 17th, which is today at 5 p.m. Eastern time today, we have the earnings presentation and conference call because that's really, I don't know, if you if you don't trade earnings much and you don't follow it much, I don't know if you're aware of this, but that's really what you're trading is the conference call information. The conference call has been shown by a study out of... Uh, Northwestern and I think there are three university professors involved in it have the greatest likelihood of um, predicting follow through direction over the next, I want to say it's 24, 48 hours than the actual earnings numbers itself. Not that I trade what's after the earnings announcement, but um that's what moves the market, really. So like it will move a little bit as soon as the number comes out, but what really moves the market, what really matters is the conference call. So that's that's what we look for as far as time goes. Okay, so Alcoa. Right here, I pull up the chart but I don't look at the chart. You wanna know why? Because when I trade earnings announcements, do you, do you know the one thing that I don't do is I don't commit to a direction. I traded complete, I traded completely from a volatility standpoint, non-directional. So what I do is I look at the options. And by the way, um, I am doing a complete presentation on 
uh, well, I say presentation, I'm doing a complete online training of our earnings trading process um, beginning next week. And you're invited. Uh, you can register for it by going to marketstaker.com slash REG. And I'll just, I'll post that link in here. Markettaker.com slash REG, short for register. Uh, and you're invited to attend that online training next week where I go through how our system works. So I look at this and like, here's basically the gist of it, okay? <clears throat> I look to see if a time spread uh, measures out to being a logical trade and there's a great deal of technique involved there. But the one thing that I do know is that over the past five years or so, a trade in Alcoa triggered three times, time thread. Uh, no, actually one of them was a straddle now that I'm looking at this. Two of them were time spreads. One of them was a straddle. And all three of them, were winners. I keep track of that, not necessarily because if it won in the past, it's going to win in the future, but it gives me an idea of whether the market makers are likely to accommodate my exit. Because who, quick, quick little poll here before I even go any further. Who here trades earnings? Uh, give me a, give me a, I do. If you trade earnings, give me an, I do in the chat box. Right now, please, if you trade earnings, I would appreciate it. Or give me an I don't, if you don't trade earnings. And I'm from Chicago where you have to vote at least once. So uh, <laughs> throw that in there. Okay. Uh, ooh, no. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Let's talk about this for a second. I'm, uh, the first three responses here were all no's. And I bet I know why, because it's really freaking hard to make money trading earnings because we're all so used to thinking that we need to trade direction. No one can predict direction on an earnings trade. Um, it's, it's, it's not possible because if it overperforms or underperforms analyst expectations, um, it may or may not go that way. Hey, Chumay, I will. Hey, you've been in some of my personal webinars, haven't you? I believe I recognize that name. In my parts, it's not a super common name, so I'm thinking maybe it's the same person. So yeah, I'll I'll get to time spread in one second. So yeah, oh, okay, let me just get to time spread right now. So a time spread is an options trading strategy, which is also called a calendar, uh, which adds to some confusion. Those terms are synonymous, where a trader buys one option and sells another option. Both are on the same stock. Both have the same strike price, but they have two different expirations. We're always buying the longer term and selling the shorter term. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give you a big part of the crux of this strategy that I use. But don't trade this until you actually see the online training that I'm doing next week because there's some nuance to this. Basically, here's what we're doing is we're we're buying the day before an earnings announcement, or technically I should say the session before the earnings announcement, because this trading session that we're in right now, today's trading session between 9.30 and 4 Eastern time, is the session immediately before the announcement, which is right after the close. If it's after the close today or before the open tomorrow, Today's session is when we would make the trade. So we're putting on this trade going into earnings and we're going to take it off tomorrow. All right. 
But right now I'm teaching you kind of how this works and how we think about lining it up, et cetera, et cetera. But I never make these trades until the last hour of the day. If you're taking notes, write that down. We don't make earnings trades until the last hour of the day. Why? A couple of reasons. One is because when it comes to time spreads, and I'll just kind of uh, haphazardly-ish model one out here for you. Um, this is probably not the one I would actually trade, but basically what I'm doing when I'm looking at time spreads is I'm looking for, oh, I got the wrong strike here. Sorry about that. Let's get rid of that. Buy that puppy sell that puppy. basically i'm buying a lower volatility and i'm selling in probably inflated volatility there's several steps we have to take to to uh verify that statement basically what we're doing is we're looking for the front volatility to crush to go down <clears throat> and We'd model that out. I have like a whole spreadsheet. Um, here, I'll show you what that looks like. I have a whole spreadsheet where I put in all the data uh, that I need, including the haircuts, et cetera, et cetera. Backfall bottom. Out. And when we put this on, as long as the stock doesn't move too much, we win. Now, you might find that to be an ironic sort of thing. Because earnings day is typically the busiest day of the quarter. It's like it has the biggest move of the quarter many times, or at least definitely one of the biggest moves of the quarter. So why on earth would I put on a time spread going in to earnings? Why on earth would I put on a trade that loses if it moves too much on the day that it's going to move a lot? Seems a little bit crazy, right? Well, that's where measuring comes in, right? Uh, we we model this out. We look at the exact amount of the gap. We we measure out the what I call the modeled and durable gap, because a lot of the time, the implied volatility just gets too overpriced, and it would have to move like a massive amount, way too much, um, and it just becomes a high probability trade, which again, can be, can appear to be a little bit ironic unless you, you know, go through and do all the measurements. All right. So that being said, this is one of the trades that I'm going to look at in the last hour of the day and maybe go through and um, actually put it on in the last hour of the day. Oh, so, oh, so one, oh, so here are the, here are the, reasons why I do it in the last hour of the day. That's where I was going with this. Because here's what happens. What we're really trading here is this front expiration, having the implied volatility being too expensive. Now, if you're newer to options, um, you know, you, you, you know, you, you don't know some of these terms that I'm using, that's okay. Go, go to uh, the training that I have, online training I have next week. We'll talk more about this and where you can learn more about this. But that implied volatility being 100 basically means that these option prices where I can sell this option, it, it, that could indicate that it's overpriced. And if I'm selling something that's overpriced, that's arguably good, right? So two things, one is this number is probably going to be higher later, which means that this number, relatively speaking, is going to be higher later, and I'm just going to be able to get more juice out of it. So that's one reason I wait till the last hour of the day. The other reason is um, because if this if Alcoa moves too much, I lose, I want to give it as little time to move as possible. Because, I mean, if I put it on this morning, it, it could go through the break even by the end of the day. Or, you know, where's the best spot for this to be tomorrow morning? Well, right here at the strike price. If if the market sells off a little bit and Alcoa sells off, we're down here. Now I don't have a really a neutral trade anymore. 
it can move a little bit to the downside and I lose, or it can move a lot to the upside. I end up with basically a bullish trade. For those of you who are um, familiar with options, kind of something they're talking about is delta. I end up getting a bigger delta when I'm when I'm down here, which I could look at just by looking at what we call the price slices. See, if I'm looking at it, if I change this, if I take this price and I make it uh, 35, let's just make this, how about 35 and a half? Right here, <laughs> see that the delta goes from a pretty small 15 to 50, gets a lot bigger. So then I have a bullish bias, which I don't want. So I always wait till the last hour of the day. Man, I'm giving away all my secrets over here. Holy cow. Um, am I going to be doing an iron condor? No. When, when I model this out properly in the last hour of the day, the trade that I will make if it passes my test is a time spread or a calendar, not an iron condor. Iron condors have <clears throat> some disadvantages. Typically, time spreads work better than iron condors uh, when it comes to trading volatility trades on earnings place. Whew. What a fun thing. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, Another thing that I want to look at today and by the way, you can feel free to throw in your symbols uh, for me to look at. In the meantime, one that I was looking at here was in JP Morgan. <laughs> and in JP Morgan, we've had this like, uh, you know, we had earnings come out. And look at this, like they made $4.44. The estimate was 418, actual is 444. So they actually beat estimates and the stock fell 10 bucks. On earnings. That's why we don't try and guess direction when it comes to earnings. Not possible. But anyway, their earnings are over for the quarter. So this risk of a big move is over. Sometimes we see some follow through and sometimes we see it uh, heading back up. But one thing that I do know for sure is that this move happened on extremely high volume, the highest volume that we've seen in the past six months. This move that ended up in about an unchanged sort of day when it all came down to it was also pretty high volume one of the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh highest volume day of the past six months. This one was the sixth highest volume day of the past six months. And this one, well, we're just starting out, shaping up to be a down day. I'm thinking that at some point, this is going to maybe start burning itself out. And if we go back here, we had some resistance at this level. Had about three days where it really fought to break through resistance, and then it did. And of course, resistance became support, which leads me to what we're talking about right now, support. So <clears throat> an interesting trade to look at here in JP Morgan is a put credit spread. And Fred, uh, Fred, I'll get back to your comments in one second. But yes, I am. I'm looking to take advantage of the IV crush is, is how I put it. But that also happens with time spreads. But we get more protection when it comes to time spreads. And we make more, basically we make more and we risk less when we use a time spread to trade earnings instead of an iron condor. We're de I'm definitely looking forward to Oh yeah, it's a debit because it's a time spread. Yeah, that's sort of confusing. Uh, and, and I'll get I'll, I'll get back to that. Yeah, because you're bringing up some some good points to talk about. Uh, don't let me forget. I'm I'm going to get back to that Alcoa trade. But here, let me finish with this one. <clears throat> so resistance became support 
And right now we're sitting at support. 180 is support. So I could be very aggressive and I could sell the 180 puts and buy like the one, well, how are these strikes? Yeah, buy the 177 and a half put. <clears throat> I could do that for the ones that expire in two days and I'd have a pretty nice meaty trade. But the problem is I'm only 20 cents away from running into trouble if I, if I make that trade. So instead, what I may consider doing is giving myself what I like to call a little wiggle room. <clears throat> if I think it's going to stay above 180, well, that means I also think it's going to stay above 177 and a half. And if I give myself that extra $2.50, I've got a better chance of winning. I've got a higher likelihood of winning on this. So what I'm going to do here <laughs> is look at this 177 and a half. In fact, I actually kind of like this trade, especially since it's only a two-day trade. Uh, we do have the weekly unemployment figure coming out tomorrow. And the beige book is today. So I don't want to put on any really big trades or anything, but let's just model this time spread out. Or not time spread, uh, put credit spread. <laughs> it's $2.50 wide. 177 and a half minus 175 is $2.50. My I, I use what I call the 10% rule that the credit I need to bring in, or the credit I bring in needs to be at least 10% of that strike width. So I'm like right there on the threshold. But it's only a two-day trade. As long as it doesn't go down below 177 and a half, the trade wins. And so we're looking at like here. I kind of like this trade. I don't like that the market itself is pretty heavy. But I like it enough to, whoops, going the wrong way. I like it enough to just dip my toe in the water here. Great duplicate order. I'm going to put it in mid market. And I'm glad I did. Huh? Put it in mid market and got filled. <clears throat> Nothing like getting the blood a little pump in here in the morning, huh? Um, okay, so that's one of the trades that I like, which I just use our credit spread genius scanner to get that trade idea. Um, so for Fred's purposes, let's go back to that Alcoa trade. Uh, oh, what did I do? Remove it? Yeah, see, look, <clears throat> this is why I, this is why, exact reason why I wait till the end of the day. This was about 30 cents higher earlier. So I probably don't want to do the 37 strike now. If I was making this now, I do the 36 and a half strike. <clears throat> I always want to do the closest to the money strike. So Fred asked a very, uh, intelligent question so if what we're looking for is for the volatility to fall why on earth would we be having a net debit transaction doesn't that mean that if volatility falls the spread gets worth less we pay for it if we pay for something we want to get worth more right so <clears throat> Here's what makes time spreads tricky, whether they're earnings time spreads or not, is that you're buying one option, you're selling another, and you want low volatility. Low volatility, you know, from the historical volatility standpoint, we don't want it to move too much. And from the implied volatility standpoint, we want the implied volatility to fall. But here's the thing. The implied volatility 
is going to fall more in the front expiration and just a little in the back expiration. And I have tools to measure all those out to help estimate how much that is. And, and that's what that's what I use to see if the trade makes sense. But, you know, if this one, I mean, if both volatilities fell to like 50, this one would fall 50 points. This one would only fall 11 points. So, it, it, Fred, it is very, very tricky uh, thinking about time spreads for that reason. What you have to do is kind of forget what you know about Vega. And, you know, I'm using some very uh, maybe more advanced option terms. So if you're newer to options, you know, don't sweat it. Um, you're, you're here to learn, pick up information, right? Uh, so happy to explain any terms that I use. <clears throat> So yeah, we don't want to look at the net Vega when it comes to time spreads ever, earnings time spreads or regular time spreads. We want to look at the disparity in volatilities. Yeah. Um, ah, JP Morgan, of course, had earnings, but Netflix is coming tomorrow. Yeah, Netflix is, uh, so let me look at my list here. Tomorrow... Tomorrow after the close, right, after the close. Uh, so I wouldn't make a trade in Netflix today. And truth be told, most of the earnings trades that I make are not, you know, your, your big brand name stocks that everybody talks about. Those are often the worst candidates for earnings trades. I don't, I don't have I ever even made it? Uh, trade uh, an earnings trade in Netflix. Hold on, let me check my list here. I only tried it one time, and and that one was a losing trade. So it's just those ones that move too much. When you model them out, they they don't trigger a trade. So Netflix, I mean. <clears throat> I, I I won't even look at until tomorrow because I always put them on basically the hour, the last hour in the session right right before earnings. Um, so to me, there's no trade to be made in Netflix right now. Uh, good, you guys are asking very good questions. You're participating. I love it. At least some of you guys are. Um, there's an, that's another ironic thing, isn't it? The people who ask questions tend to be the smartest people uh, because they want to learn more. But you know, we are you know we naturally feel from that fear in adolescence when you're in class uh, and and you think, oh, geez, if I ask a question, people are going to think I don't know the answer and I'm stupid. Uh, but no, when you ask questions, it actually means you want to learn the answer, and that means you're smart. So participation is encouraged because you are here because you're smart. You have that thirst for knowledge. Okay, um, another trade that I wanted to look at is, uh, <laughs> no, nothing there. Oh yeah, this is, yeah. Somebody was asking about iron condors earlier, and uh, I do have a scanner for those. One triggered an AMD earlier, and it's actually it's actually kind of starting to work out a little better. But I, it's a trade that kind of makes me nervous. Um, this one is. The 155, 157 and a half, 160, 162 and a half put condor, not iron condor, but condor, which is synthetically identical, but that expires next week. And so if we were to trade that, AMD would have to be between 160 and 162 and a half next week, eight days from now. And I don't know when their earnings are. I could look it up, 
but their last one was, I mean, that's going to be coming up pretty darn close to earnings. For this stock to stay between 160 and 162 and a half for the next week seems almost impossible. So yeah, that's definitely a false positive uh, hitting that scanner. Um, what other stocks would you like me to look at? I love doing this kind of stuff. This is all like, if I had my dithers, this is what, this is all I would do all day long. Well, I mean, except work with our other student traders. Um, this is my, this is my two passions. That and my many hobbies and my little dogs, one of which is asleep on my lap. Um, okay, what other symbols you want me to look at here, folks? Huh? I am yours for the next 33 minutes. All right. Well, another interesting one to look at is Citigroup. <laughs> So many of the banks have already announced, many of the big major Wall Street banks have already announced. So Citigroup, and actually this is pretty interesting too here. Let's take a look. So the estimate for earnings was $1.28, actual was $1.58. Sucker popped up and then came right back down. And you know, I people digesting the information from the conference call. <laughs> the cross below the 21 day moving average, which is very often a very strong indicator that there will be follow through. Um, and you can kind of see this one had a couple of days of follow through. So, you know, like that's, they're typically short term trades. I mean, this one had, well, six months of follow through basically. Um, probably would have got in here and exited here, but. Um, and then, you know, so therefore the 21 day moving average ends up being a support or resistance level until cross, and then it's a resistance or support level. So yeah, we popped up on the earnings beat here, but then it came down as people digested the information from the conference call. And then we got that classic follow through through the 21 day moving average. When it went through the 50 day moving average, now that's a big deal because that acts the same, but it's usually, excuse me, an even stronger support or resistance level. <laughs> Here it busted through resistance, which became support and never looked back until yesterday. Closed below it, now we're back above it, um, which would just basically be like bouncing off support even though it went through it, you know, it kind of still counts as bouncing off support. So today's a really pivotal day in Citigroup. <clears throat> now the trade that some, that uh, somebody is looking at here is a time spread. May 3rd, May 24th, no, May 3rd, May 10th, 57 put time spread. That's an interesting one to model. So let's model that puppy out. Speaking of puppies, my dog just jumped off my lap. <laughs> so the 57, so the May 4, let's close this, close this, May 3rd, May 10th, right? Yeah, May 3rd, May 10th, 57 put. Oops. Hmm. So this one, not earnings, not an earnings trade, which is great um, because it's arguably going to have less risk. We're able to sell a slightly higher implied volatility, one point higher, which is, you know, which is fine. If it was a lot of points higher, we might think that there's something, you know, a move expected in there. <laughs> so huh? Let's, let's model this time spread out here. So we sell the 57 puts here. So this is actually a slightly bearish time spread. We risk 21 cents. 
<laughs> so that's the most we can lose. And our break even here, let's send tomorrow's days, our break even, we hold this until May 3rd, which is like two weeks, right? <clears throat> The stock has to stay between 55.33 and 58.82. Let's uh, slice this to chart. So the it's got to basically stay between these two red lines. So interesting. <clears throat> It looks like there's a slightly bearish trade kind of banking on this 50 day moving average. It's saying below the 50 day moving average, but not having a mess of follow through. Yeah, interesting. Pretty high volume days here. So did the move burn itself out? Well, one of my favorite tools for that is RSA. But no, we're not getting an oversold signal in RSI. Uh, so let's remove RSI. The other one I like to check is slow stochastics. There, we're not really getting a full oversold signal there either. And when the red line crosses below it, to me that indicates that it could be oversold, but when the red line <clears throat> what you really want to see on slow stochastics is something like this. See how this this stock started coming down at this point? Well, really at this point, this is the first kind of confirmation of it. When the red line, which is the faster of the two, crosses below the purple line, the slower of the two, and we're above 80, we're below 20 for that matter, this is a very, very strong signal that very often plays out and comes to fruition. And we, sh man, we sure got that, uh, but we don't have that. So this is a very strong overbought signal that worked out. If you would have shorted it, you know, bought puts or something here, you could have made some pretty decent money, but we don't have the oversold signal here. We would need that purple line to be below 20 and then the red lines cross above the purple line and then above the 20 line. And, and that then and only then would we want to play a bullish figure there. So moral of the story is this is a pretty decent trade. You can lose 200 bucks. Best, best, best case scenario makes 600 bucks. But I always like to kind of go basically take the top of the TP to the zero line and cut that in half. So we're talking about like right about here, really our maximum profits about 300 or a, a reasonable profit target is about 300. So we risk 200 to make hopefully about 300 if it falls in that range. Uh, I don't know. It's not a trade that I love. It's a, it's a tempting trade. It's a tempting trade. It's a really tempting trade, but I'm going to forego. I mean, there's kind of one reason why I'm almost don't want to forego it because this is a heavy market. And I took a positive Delta trade in another one of the banks just now, JP Morgan. So if I take this slightly negative Delta trade that balances out and it balances me, my uh, sector risk out. So then I'm not bullish on the banking section i'm neutral on the banking section sector and hopefully that both of these trades work out uh so i'm kind of tempted to make that uh, oh geez i'm kind of tempted to make this i'm going to make this trade here um 
but I'm just going to do a really small, it's a, it's, it's a dip in the old toe in the water here. Keep this. I'm going to keep it mid-market. If I don't get filled, I'm completely fine with that. Oh, but I just got to keep saying that. I'm okay if I don't get filled. Bring You get filled. All right. So I kind of like this little banking sector uh, setup I got going here. Okay. So T. Joseph wants to look at Bob, 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 Baran. <clears throat> me. So Baba, when is Baba's earnings? Their last earnings were 227 or 27. So probably somewhere around 57. I'm not going to look it up. I think that any short-term trade uh is not something I would need to <clears throat> worry about earnings being in there. Not necessarily oversold from a slow stochastic standpoint. Let me get some more real estate on my screen, get rid of that until I need it again. I like to keep my trading screens clean and not too fancy. Okay. So Baba, I mean, one of the other things we need to consider is that this market in general is pretty weak, right? <clears throat> SPY, I mean, we're, look, this is just what I was talking about. Cross below the 21 day moving average, you get follow through. Cross below the 50 day moving average, you tend to get follow through. And this now becomes resistance rather than support. <clears throat> and these were very high volume days, which means that this battle between buyers and sellers, the sellers got the upper hand. They took control of the market, they knocked out all those bids, and there were a lot of bids. And now those bids are, you know, they're they're drying up. So there is definitely a possibility of seeing a little bit more of a pullback here. So that being said, <clears throat> that's in the U.S. If we're looking at Baba, we need to concern ourselves with China, which starts getting a little bit more complicated, but that's all right. And when we look at some of these ADRs, which are American Depository Receipts, which is basically a foreign stock that we're able to trade in on, on the US exchanges. <clears throat> we With ADRs, we typically see a more choppy market because this is not really the primary, I mean, this is not the primary market for Alibaba. We get a crap ton of volume in it, but it's, you know, it's not the primary market. So, I mean, we're here, but there's no, in, in the six month period, there's the dots. In the six month period or this year period, we're not at a support level. I mean, support was here at like 70, 70. 70 and a half, right around here. We busted through that level. And now there's really nothing until we get down to about 67-ish. <clears throat> Same thing here, but we have like, um, almost like a death cross, but shorter, uh, shorter period moving averages. 21 day cross below the 50 day. <clears throat> And then uh, the stack itself crossed below the 21 day, crossed below the 50 day, peaked its little head up with, the, and this is what is called choppy, where we get these, these, well, we call this an island reversal, typically uh, the perfect island reversal. It's just one trading period, like here, this is a perfect island reversal where we tend to get a lot of follow through. But this is sort of like a, uh, Archipelago reversal. I'm making up. I'm making up trading uh, charting patterns now. Archipelago go, uh, re reversal. And I mean, man, man alive. This is such a. I mean, this is such a very, very strong bear signal. Oh my gosh. Hold on a second. 
I, I need to I need to bring my favorite indicators back up here. Uh, let's start with RSI. Add, apply, boom, boom, boom. So not oversold. Not oversold. Slow stochastics. Get rid of this puppy. Not oversold. So, I mean, there is... This ends up being kind of a... Kind of a interesting little bear play here, doesn't it? Kind of like this. But here's what we got to concern ourselves with. If we're actually seriously looking at potentially making a trade, what we need to do is verify when earnings are. So B A B A investor. It's pretty unlikely. Earnings and financial. Maybe there. Oh, yes. You know, that's what I thought. Events. There we go. More events are coming. Oh, so they didn't even list their, they, they don't even list their earnings yet. Unless there's a press release, but sometimes that changes. Announces withdrawal, announces December results. Yeah, so they didn't even announce when they're going to have earnings. <laughs> so, man, if I ever saw a great technical set, and I haven't looked at Alibaba chart in a while. I wish I looked at this a couple of days ago. I wish I looked at it on Monday. But this still has some potential follow through, especially when the U.S. market is heavy. I mean, the Chinese market, I mean, you just look at this chart and you see the Chinese market has problems, even if you don't read the news. I mean, Alibaba is like a bellwether stock. But the problem is the implied volatility is massively high. You know what my favorite thing about trading options is, though? We can take a problem and turn it into a strength. <clears throat> If I'm bearish, my go-to thought is, okay, maybe I'll look at buying puts, but they're probably going to be way too expensive because the implied volatility is way above the historical volatility and like basically in the top half of the past six months. Um, so <clears throat> let's look at puts. I always like to buy a little more time than I need so that the time decay stays lower. So these options are somewhat overpriced. Boy, the 30 days are even more overpriced, but that's because that's when earnings is probably around there. I'm looking at these 23 day or maybe just six, probably the 16 day ones. And I don't want to buy the puts because they're too expensive. <clears throat> so what I'm more likely to do is want to sell like a call a credit spread, probably at that 50-day moving average that just became resistance uh, four days ago. So that moving average is at 73.35. So I'd really have to sell about the 75 and a half calls, to, you know, maybe the 75 calls. Yeah, you can't really get much for them though. 48 cents. R risking 91 cents to make nine cents doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You don't want to buy the puts because they're arguably overpriced. The only thing you might be able to do is a put debit spread where I buy you know, in the money puts and sell an out of the money put. <clears throat> which actually has a nice volatility skew to it. Let's model that out. Do a nice conservative one where we risk very little. We risk a dollar to make a dollar. Kind of want something a little better than that, I think. Okay, 
by the 70 puts, sell the 67 puts. <laughs> so now we risk a dollar 37 to make a dollar 63. It's somewhat better. But in order for this trade to really work out well, we need to see Alibaba fall another three points, which is like about two something percent. On the chart, that is our support. So we'd be looking for it to fall all the way to support. It's not a bad trade. I think if we, if I were looking at Alibaba on Monday, well, actually, I, on Monday, I probably wouldn't have made it. But yesterday, I would have made it after we bro officially broke through support. It's not a bad trade. I'm just going to, I kind of want to track this one. So I'm, I'm just going to buy a, a one lot here, uh, put it in mid-market. If I don't get filled, I don't care. Oh, nope, didn't happen. Okay, so that's my assessment of Alibaba. EFX financial stock, I believe earnings after close to that. EFX, huh? <laughs> Think or Swim says earnings today, AMC. Trust but verify. Famous... Russian saying appropriated by Ronald Reagan. Hey, there we go. Grazie. <clears throat> uh, recent news, IR calendar. Yep, tomorrow before the open. Okay. Tomorrow before the open. Do you ever wonder where do all the web pages go when you close them? Is there like web page heaven? I don't know where they go. So uh, yeah, we got earnings tomorrow morning. So the only thing that I would ever trade going into earnings, Fred, well, there's two things, either a time spread or a straddle. And th those are basically opposite ends of the spectrum. When I, at the end of the day, in the last hour, when I do my complete analysis, if it triggers at all, and 90%, 85% of the time, a, do, a trade does not trigger, but of the 15% of the time that a trade does trigger, 90% of that time, it's a time spread that triggers. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I'm just going to go here, look at this, and this is just a pre-analysis. We do, holy geez, Louise. I mean, look at that. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta put, I gotta put this one on my list to look at later for reals. Uh, and of course, Alcoa, since we've already verified. We've got a very high implied volatility here compared to a very low implied volatility here. I prefer when there's weeklies, but we don't necessarily need week, weeklies. But you know what we do need is liquidity. And there are a number of ways to measure for liquidity. <clears throat> One way to measure for liquidity that people like to use is open interest. And there's not a, you know, metric crap ton of open interest here. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, if we're trading anything less than it, 10 lot, um, which in this case... I, I like to put $1,000 into each earnings trade and just make a bunch of them throughout earnings season. Uh, so, you know, throughout this three week period, you know, I might make $50,000 worth of trades, but I like to do increments of 1,000 at a time. So if I were to make a trade here, let's see, 1130 minus eight <clears throat> is three bucks. So basically I'd be trading a three lot. So, I mean, if I'm only trading a three lot, this is probably enough open interest to support my trade. So the other liquidity measure that I like to look at is just simply what's the difference between the bid and the ask. And my rule is, well, this is another 10% rule. The offer should never be higher than 
should never be more than 10% higher than the bid. So basically we take the bid price, which is 790, and take 10% of that, which is 79 cents, no, 80 cents. So $8 plus 80 cents, 10% of it is 880. So the offer is less than 880. So it's less than 10%. This one here is 10%, which is the threshold. Everything else looks to be, well, these 230 puts are pretty darn wide. We tend to have, we actually tend to have better earnings trades with puts than calls. It's a strange little quirk of option pricing. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, this is one that for sure I'm going to be looking at later. There's a really good chance of this triggering. Uh, USO calls. So when you say calls, I am presuming you are talking about buying calls, a bullish trade. Yeah. <laughs> and we have these. Uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday expirations here. Don't have to worry about liquidity. There's thousands in open interest. So if we pull up the chart, we did have a pattern called the green or the red knockout trigger here, <clears throat> which is a bullish pattern with a price target of 88.38, <clears throat> which oh, that's a very high haircut. Put that at 100. 85.92 would be the target. But once we get down below the eponymous red knockout candle, I would have been out of the I would have been out of this trade already, taking a small loss. But um <clears throat> hey, now that it's a little bit after the fact, we don't care about the red knockout that triggered anymore. This 21 day moving average is going to tend to act like support until it's crossed. And if it crosses, we get follow through. Um, <clears throat> I don't love, we don't have a ton of other support at this level here. Um, so I don't, yeah, this is, there's not a, there's some support here, you know, right? If we go back to this date. There's some support here, but not a ton. I think in USO, what I would really prefer to do is wait and see what happens with this 21-day moving average. <clears throat> and if it crosses it, jump on board. If it bounces off it, jump on board. Oh, Jeff, you're looking for 80 to hold. Yeah, I mean... Honestly, I would, gun to my head, do I think the 21-day moving average holds and it bounces higher or gets crossed and and shoots lower? I agree with you, Jeff, uh, that I, I would be looking for 80 to hold also. But we need, like, we need very concrete uh, confirmations when it comes to our trading. The only evidence that I have that 80 might hold is that we're coming up on the 21 day moving average, which is more likely than not to, to, to give a bounce rather than cross. And like I said, either way, if it bounces, we're very likely to see follow through. If it's cross, we're very likely to see lower follow through. <laughs> hmm. I mean, another level of support which is something that I've been looking at a lot more lately, is volume. And we can look at volume a number of different ways. We can look at um, volume at price, but we can also just kind of keep it as is and say, hey, look, this, this is a day when the stock opened lower, but closed higher on the day. It was an up day. It was up from the open and up from yesterday's close. And it had massive volume, the second highest volume day in six months. 
followed by the third highest volume day in six months where the sellers really took control. This doji was on practically no volume, well, an average volume day. So this gives credence to having market support from a volume standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, historically, the 21-day SMA has been support. It sure has. You know, I mean, it has crossed through, but, you know, like, <clears throat> it's still traded, you know, it's still traded within it. So, like, this this does not count. I mean, this counts here. Once we got to this point. Uh, this, you know, you wouldn't have jumped on a trade here or here. Here you might have jumped on a, well, no, because you would have waited for a confirmation candle and it would have been green. You probably would have, I mean, you certainly would have jumped on here, especially because it bounced back above the 200 day moving average. Uh, but, you know, moral to the story is I, I need one more day for confirmation, maybe two more days. Uh, if it's, if it's, if we stay above the, well, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if we go a little bit below it or not. But if tomorrow we're back above the 21 day moving average, that could be confirmation enough. And I might look at taking a bullish trade. If we close below it tomorrow, I'm gonna wait one more day and then I might look at uh, a bearish trade. But the implied volatility is pretty high. So this is another one where we might have to do, um, <clears throat> we might have to do a spread to spread off that volatility risk. Yeah. You guys are great. I like I I love chatting with you you guys. Yeah, yeah, Fred, from a fundamental standpoint. Absolutely. I mean that's that's what really matters is is the fundamentals. Oh, you oh, you're thinking a 3 month trade. I see. Well, that's <clears throat> with something like USO here, we really have to think about the fundamentals, and that's very, very difficult to predict unless you're an expert on on that stuff. Oh, oh, yeah, you're talking about the seasonality, yeah. the The military conflict thing, I think, is a bigger thing than seasonality, though. All right. Uh, I am at the end of my time here. Uh, so I gave you all a special invitation to join me for that earnings trading uh, tr online training. It's just markettaker.com slash R-E-G, short for red register. So make sure you register for that. It's a, it, earnings trading is my thing that I'm known for. Uh, so I really want to have the opportunity to share it with you. And that being said, looks like I'm at the end of my time. Uh, make sure you hang out and catch the rest of the speakers. One thing that I know is David puts together just a fantastic roster of, uh, of people to listen to. So there's going to be some really, really great minds coming up. So don't go anywhere. Stick around. Uh, but my time here is done. Thanks for allowing me to share it with you. Um, all right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think I'm done, right, uh, David? I'm glad, I'm good to keep talking. But I just want to make sure I don't uh, take away time for from the next person. Well, Nobody likes dead air. So I'm going to keep talking until David jumps in. Um, if there's anything else you want to look at real, I mean, probably really quick and we run the risk of uh, me just getting cut off in the middle, but I'm glad. Oh, VXX. Yes. <laughs> VXX used to be something I traded all the time. And I've been 
thinking about getting back into that. Got to look at the volatility of volatility. I mean, it's high. It's very ripe for credit spreads, but it's a pretty tricky trade right now, too. We don't, the one thing we can't do is look at technicals when it comes to volatility products because they're they're a derivative. Well, they're a derivative of a derivative, technically. And so the chart itself doesn't really give me decent enough information, but it gives me a little bit of context. <clears throat> and so for me, like I definitely don't look at moving averages, but for me, I would be probably looking at something like a put credit spread, which is the opposite of what I would typically be doing in VXX because it does have that um, contango bleed uh, for those of you who are familiar with VXX, which basically gives it a downward bias over time, as you can see. But in times of um, uncertainty, we can take the other side of that trade um, and analyze, of course, the term structure of VXX to see if we are indeed still in contango. And I, I, and I hadn't looked at that. But again, I don't want to get too in the weeds with anything because uh, we got somebody coming up right after me. And David, I'll just remind you, feel free to jump in whenever uh, whenever it's time. So if we pull up these futures. Thanks, David. Oh, you had calls a little too early? Don't you hate when that happens? But you know what, Jeff, as long as you followed your plan, can't beat yourself up about that. <laughs> so let's see here. April, May, June. Huh. This is not, that's a pretty flat uh, term structure here. So we're we're not really experiencing the bleed right now, the con, the typical contango bleed. You go further out in time into July, and and yes, we are. But in the short term, and really all that, all that really matters are these right here, April, May, and June. <clears throat> Because that's where the you know that's where the roles are going to be happening, uh, and they're pretty, pretty darn flat. So I mean that gives me a little bit more. That gives me a little bit more uh, conviction in taking a positive delta VXX trade. <clears throat> 